Good afternoon. You know, I was listening to Brian, and I was thinking to myself, I don't know how I follow that. <laughs> so I, I should let Brian go last, that would have been. But, but that great young man and, and great story. And listening to, uh, you know, everything leading up to this, you know, I knew that I'm in the right place, you know, when I hear comments like, all lives matter and all means all. And because that's really... Um, what's driving me kind of, uh, you know, in my career is, you know, how, how do we meet the needs of all students? And, you know, how, how can we, you know, restructure our system in a, in, a, in a world, in a society that's getting increasingly complex and that leaves so many students, um, you know, fall, falling behind? And uh, I've been in this business almost four decades now. And all of my work has been down in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, and uh, where, I've, where I grew up and where I've lived pretty much uh, my life. And many in this room, if you haven't been among those who visited, probably wouldn't know where that is. But it's the very southern tip of Texas. So uh, it's as far south or probably a little further south than the southern tip of the Florida Panhandle, for example. Except it, instead of sticking out into the Gulf, it sticks out into Mexico. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, but last summer you heard about it because the three districts I've worked in all surround a city that was in the news a lot last, last summer, the city of uh, McAllen, which you probably heard about in the news with all the um, children and mothers coming across uh, the, the river by the thousands. It's, it's really something that for us, you know, all my life, that's something that I've grown up with is that, you know, where we live is an entry point into the country, both uh, across the bridge or not across the bridge, across the, across the river, both either with papers or, or, or without papers. So it's a very different, um, it's a very different part of the country, uh, but it's a, it's a great part of the country. Uh, it's an important part. It's often been a, a, maybe a neglected part of the country, uh, has one of the highest Poverty rates in the nation, one of the lowest educational attainment levels, lowest income levels, uh, high, uh, historically high dropout levels, different, diff different things like that. But it's a very important part of the country. Uh, it's a part of the country that the uh, vast majority of the population is uh, Hispanic or Latino. In Texas, we use the word Hispanic. I think most of the rest of the country uses the, the word uh, Latino more. Uh, but it's a very important part of the country. But one of the things that I've learned over the years, like I said, I've been in, this, in the business a long time, and I've, I've been a, a teacher and a coach. I've been an elementary principal. I've been a, I've been a high school principal. Um, I've worked in finance and in curriculum in central office, and I've been a superintendent in two systems. I've worked in sort of three different size systems, but I've been a superintendent in two systems, one fairly small, about 3,000 students, the one I'm in now, about 10 times larger, about 32,000 students. And in, in, in working through that, um, I think where I really, really, really began to, 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 to focus on what I felt was the need was when I was high school principal. High school principal in a small high school on the border, relatively small high school on the border, and uh, where young people really didn't have the aspiration to go to college. Very few were going on to college. And I really worked as a principal to change that, brought in different curriculum, brought in advanced coursework, really worked with the students, worked on getting everybody to fill out the applications, the FAFSA, worked on instruction in the classroom, worked on following up, and made some good progress, but always seemed like not enough. And always seemed like got to the point where all the students almost seemed to aspire to college, but really getting them connected afterwards um, was a challenge, and then getting, noticing that a lot of them, I would see them around town later, and they really didn't stick in college sometimes, to, to the level. So pr progress was made, but not enough. And later on, as I, a number of years later, it became superintendent, about 10 or 11, uh, I'd been superintendent a few years, about 10 or 11 years ago, um, somebody presented to me a concept that in our district, if we would be willing to kind of be a guinea pig in the state of Texas and, be, and start one of the first early college high schools in the state. So I, I hadn't heard of what that was. I looked it up, I started researching on it, and I said, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I'm looking for. 
blending high school and college so students can start their college coursework. And I'd been, we'd done some dual enrollment when I was high school principal and that, you know, that, you know, that, that had some impact. But to completely redesign a high school that so high school and college are completely blended together. And so uh, I won't go through the whole story, but what I will tell you is um, right off the bat, my first approach to it was, well, I don't want to start one. All means all, so let's just turn the whole high school into one. And I won't go through all the battles that that took, but over a few months, we got authorization and got the Gates Foundation and the state agency and the university system and other partners to change their mind instead of starting an early college high school, but allow us to transform a whole high school of about 800 students into wall-to-wall -wall early college high school. And that was in the town of Hidalgo, south of McAllen, literally right on the river, right on the International Bridge, and uh, that's been a great success in that, uh, in, in that community. And uh, today, um, for the last several years now, almost very close, about 97, 98% of the students graduate having already started college and increasing numbers with uh, two years or more um, and associate degrees and, 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 and things like that. After, kind of got that going and really began looking at uh, how this would work out in a larger system, and is it really possible when you talk about all means all? I moved to a, a nearby neighboring district, Far San Juan Alamo, 10 times larger. And uh, I moved into that district, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of this just so you can understand. Um, you know, there's several things that I've learned on, on my career, during my career, and uh, to, to this date, and several of them were mentioned, in fact, all of them were mentioned here today. And one is, we've gotta build on the strengths of our community. So every design is gonna be different. When you're designing your work, you gotta build on the strengths of your community. You know, this is true throughout history. So you go all over the world and you go some places and houses are built out of mud or bricks. You go other places, they're built out of wood. Other places, they're built out of, what do they build out of typically? Till the, kind of the modern era where we transport everything ever, but typically they build out of what? What they had. That you build out of the strengths of, uh, of, what, it, of what is in your community. And you can build good homes out of all of those things. And um, so you build on the strengths of your community. So building on strengths is one thing that's very important. So in, in, in my community, both school districts I, that, uh, that I've been superintendent of, the student population is 99% Hispanic. Uh, most of our students come to school not knowing English. So one of the things that I've worked on designing in both systems is make that a strength. And so we really focus on biliteracy, that both languages are important. And if we can develop these students to be highly uh, you know, high achievers in both languages, then they're gonna lead the way. We live in a global society. Um, uh, and, and so building on strengths. Another one is opportunities. When opportunities come, you know, I didn't think up this early college thing. Somebody came to me and said, we'd like you to take a look at this. Great opportunity. Now, I was fortunate enough with the team that I worked with that we were able to tweak that opportunity and turn it into something beyond and, and different from what, the way it was presented to us. But without that opportunity, somebody bringing that opportunity. So when a door opens, you know, take advantage of that opportunity. And then the other one is partnerships. It takes working together and relationships. So relationships on your own team internally, relationships with your external partners, all of these things are very different. But in 2007, I moved to, uh, like I said, a district uh, about 10 times larger, Far San Juan Alamo, why such a long name? It's three cities or three small, three, three small cities. And uh, uh, you can't leave any of them out in the partnership, right? So all three, <laughs> all three, are, in the, all three are in the name. And uh, I entered that district at a really time when the school district was, was extremely tr troubled. And you'd probably be thinking this wouldn't be a time to come in with you know, lot, lots of big change. But I, when I entered that district, there were major issues in the district. There were huge governance problems. In all honesty, the, uh, the FBI was in there. Um, there were administrators and, uh, you know, district leadership, both at the governance level, the administrative level, that wound up um, getting indicted and convicted just as I was coming in the door, all that was happening. Um, the dropout rate was more than double the state average. All three large comprehensive high schools were going down what I call, they were circling the drain on the federal AYP system. They were, one was moving already towards getting ready to restructure and the other two were falling right behind it. And uh, there were uh, 
a lot of gang issues in the community and in the high schools and so forth. So it was a time of great trouble. What we, it initially, the first focus that I chose was on the dropout problem. And as I looked at the dropout problem, and again, I won't go into that in, in detail, but as I looked at the dropout problem, we, we, did some, we opened an innovative high school for dropouts for 18 to 26 year olds. And we partnered with a community college and brought in dual enrollment for older young people that were dropouts and uh, got that rolling. And uh, it wasn't easy. Um, the, initially, there was a lot of criticism, like, oh, so you're going to help the dropouts get college, so you're teaching the other kids, what, drop out and you'll get college or, you know, different things like that. My answer was, no, that's what we should be doing in all our high schools. But we, we started there. So really just started with something the first year, dual enrollment for dropouts. At the end of the first year, an opportunity came again because the community college came over and said, we've got a problem. We were trying to start an early college high school with another district. We've got some foundation money and we're all ready to roll, but something happened the relationship fell apart, the partnership fell apart. And they said, we hate, we don't want to lose this opportunity. They were like, Dr. King, you opened a, a dropout recovery high school in a matter of about a month from thinking of it to opening the high school. You opened, you did that. He said, this is April. You've done early college high school before. We did a whole planning year with this other district, but everything fell apart right at the end. Can you step in, and in, this was April, can you step in and in four months get an early college high school open uh, in, in this district that was going through this, uh, these other problems that I told you about? And uh, initially I was hesitant. This district has over 8,000 high school students. And I'll be honest, I was afraid with all the problems on the high schools to set aside sort of a high school that might be seen as, a, as an elite type setup and there would be an, an escape. And because my, my passion is for all. And I wanted to make sure that whatever we did was systemic transformation. So ultimately, ultimately what we did there, what, what I did is I agreed and finally I said, you know what, we can do this on one condition. We'll set up an early college high school, but we're gonna do a couple of things. One, I want it in the district. I don't want it on the college campus. Why is that? Because I knew that if I was going to reach all, I didn't think the college was going to accept 8,000 of my students on their campus. So I said, we're going to have to figure out how to do this over here, you know, at, somewhere here in our community. <coughs> second of all, I said, the second thing is, if all the partners will agree that, this is, that the, opening this early college high school is not the goal, this is just the beginning but that this campus will be a laboratory setting where we'll learn and we'll figure all this out between the two institutions. And then we're gonna figure out how we can scale it so that we can, between our two systems, develop and build over time the capability to literally connect every student to college, to connect every student to a successful next step on their college, career, and life path. And I heard you all use that, college, career, and, and, and life, right? So the next step on their college, career, and life path. And so we began to, to work on that. And I'll come up in a few minutes. And uh, so we got that open. And then we began to f figure out how to work throughout the school district. And it's, it's large. It's very complex. Lots of stumbles. Lots of, you know, lots of walls we run into. And figure out, you know, how to get around that wall, how to get over that wall. But ultimately, o over the years, um, within a very short time, within two to three years, our high school dropout rate went from more than double the state average to less than half the state average, and that's where we still are today. We range between a third to a half the, the state average. For a community that's almost, you know, that's really all minority, almost all low income, um, in other words, those in the education business know that educational attainment levels typically in the literature track demographics. So we've been able to perform beyond what demography, for example, would say in that. Uh, same thing for high school graduation rate and, uh, and, and so forth. As we've gone forward then, the way that we have, um, the way that we have, I, I want you to, if you look at the cube up there, and I don't know if you can read it, but we've kind of put our whole system mission in a very concise way. And so we call it College Cubed, and we put our district ac ac acronym there on this uh, device made of cubes, but PSJ, College Cubed. And our, our district mission is we want all of our students ready for college, we want all of our students connected to college, and we want all of our students to complete college. 
a whole different mission. We're saying as a K-12 or pre-K-12 institution, our mission is that our students complete college. Not that they fill out their FAFSA, not that they all signed up for college, not even that they all got in this. Our mission is, and it's a challenging mission, when you talk about all, then yes, that's where that uh, create, and what is it? Design and inspire, that's, that's where that comes in. I should do the, right, what is it? There you go. See, now, that's why, see, you have to prompt me because I had it backwards. So that's where that design, create, and inspire comes in. When you're really trying to do all, you know, if you're just copying what somebody else did, you know, you just, you, you can, and I didn't hear duplicate, right? I think that's intentional. I didn't hear duplicate in there. I heard design, create, and inspire. And so in every community, the challenge is going to be different. And, and how do you go, you know, how do you go about doing that? And so as, as we've gone forward, then those are the kind of things that, that we've run into. So how do we create that system? We live in a different world. So it used to be, and I mentioned this to a few people we talked to last night, but for years, probably my whole educational career, which has been a while now, I keep hearing our schools were designed for, you know, the 19th century or they were designed on the factory model, and we've got to, we've got to redesign them. Well, most of what, that design work I hear about is internal, and it's things like, well, the students are sitting in rows, they should be sitting in circles, or you know, they should be doing devices, or the students should be doing, pro and that's all good, or get rid of grade levels, or just all kinds of, and that's all good. But to me, the biggest problem is that our school system is basically designed to just get to the end of high school and that's it. That's really what it's designed for. Yeah, we do some things at the end. In most high schools, we do some of the things at the end, help the students register for college, apply for, for scholarships, apply for financial aid, maybe some career counseling. But really, at the end of the day, we hand them a, a diploma and then they walk away. And then, you know what? Maybe they got it figured out, maybe they don't. You know, maybe they have the supports to connect and to stick, maybe they don't. I don't know if you've seen the data around the nation, but kids, young people do not stick in college. The completion rates of four-year colleges, the six-year completion rates, they're not very pretty. The completion rates of community colleges, they're not, not even close, close to what the four-year colleges are. So our systems are disconnected. So we give the students a diploma, and then hopefully they do follow up and wander around and get over there. Well, do they have the family supports? What's going on in the home? Do they have the confidence? Is the college really ready for them? Is the college, we finished, we took them all, every step of the way here and then they go over there and all of a sudden over there, it's like, you know, you're kind of on your own, uh, you know, for, for a lot of things. So how, how, do we, how do we connect these disconnected systems? So that's, that's kind of, uh, when you think of early college, high school, really think of how do you almost, how do you almost really make it one system? And I know that with our, part, our primary partner college, we partner with several, but our primary partner college, it's often kind of the joke both at the college and the high school. It's like, who's running this operation? You know, uh, the college people sometimes are like, they're like, is Dr. King or PSJ running the college? And at their district, it's kind of like, is Dr. Reed or, or, uh, or South Texas College, you know, running the district? Who's, who's running this? Well, we're both working in each other's spaces, and that's very, very important. So I wanted to kind of give you that, and so... What we're looking at is how do we create a structure and how do we create the capacity? I get asked a lot about funding. Funding is not really the main challenge. I mean, funding is a challenge. But a lot of it is if we just do something different in school, we use the same money and repurpose the same money. The big challenge is the capacity of both systems, not just financial capacity, but having the people. You know, our whole educational system, we keep talking about, you hear everything in the newspapers and it says that the world today, that, that we need like, what are the percentages? There? I read different numbers, but they're all real high of, of young people that need four-year degrees, two-year degrees, college certificates. Stop and think. Look at your systems. I look at mine. Sometimes I got asked the other day, what's the biggest challenge you see in the future? I'm like, my God, if we succeed, is the college going to be ready? You know, because if all these kids, are they really ready for all these kids to sit in the seat? You know, are they really serious? Are they, all, are they really ready for all of us? And so, you know, the, those, uh, you know, those are things. So building the capacity, and it takes time. Like, I want to do it all yesterday, but it takes time. And you, so you have to take, bite off what you can, and you start moving, you start pushing things. So anyway, as we go through, I'm, I'm going to go through just a few basic points very quickly. But in our state, 
it's an issue because Texas is a state where the educational attainment levels are below the national average. Some of you come from states that are also below the national average. Some of you uh, probably come from states where the educational attainment level is above the national average. We talk today about being competitive in a global economy within the nation, uh, you know, where we rank as a state in the nation, but also in the, in the, in the global economy. Um, the Houston Endowment is an, a nonprofit that commissioned a study a few years ago, and they were tracking, you know, Texas has been in the standardized testing business for accountability probably longer than just about anybody and for most of my educational career. And so the Houston Endowment started tracking a study to, to look at, well, what's the end product? And what they found was that in spite of harder and harder testing regimes that have come, that at the end of the day, the percentage of young people that go to and complete college hasn't moved very much. And so they found that really only, only a little bit over 20% of te Texas high school students entering eighth grade, 11 years later by about age 24, 25, had completed any level of college, just a little bit over 20%, a four-year degree, an associate degree, or a, or a certificate. Um, dem demographics... For Hispanics, 11%. For African Americans in Texas, about 11%. For Hispanic and Afri African American males, about 8%. So that's not going to take us you know, where we want to go as a state, much less for that young person, each, each individual student in their, in their life. Well, what is happening to the demographics of our state and our nation? They're changing. In Texas, it's, it's a fast change. The majority of the student population in Texas today is Hispanic. The largest, the largest group, they're not the majority yet, but the largest group, ethnically speaking, in the state in the overall population is, is now Hispanic. And in a, it won't be long before Texas is a majority Hispanic state, and that's a, a number of states. The, the national demographics are changing. So Steve Murdoch, who used to be the US Census Director and, and the Texas demographer, has done a lot of studies where he takes those demographics and he projects into the future and says, if you just do everything exactly the way you are right now and each group in your population performs the way they're performing right now, imagine if the groups that are not getting the educational attainment become a larger and larger share of your overall population, what's gonna to happen to your economy, your, your ranking in the world, all of these different things. So it's, it's, it's critical. So just demographically, our district, like I mentioned earlier, it's 99% uh, Hispanic, 98.89, I think it says there, 89% uh, economically disadvantaged, 42% of the students are classified as English language learners, they're still working on their English. When you go down the lower elementary grades, it's the majority of, of, of the students that, uh, that English is not their, is not their first language. Um, I have the state demographics to compare, so we're definitely an outlier, even, even for the state of Texas. Um, I mentioned earlier about doing dual enrollment and everything. I call early college high school like dual enrollment on steroids. And the, and, and the, the reason is because dual enrollment is great. It, dual enrollment is opportunities, and it's been around for decades. Dual enrollment is opportunities for students to take some college classes where they're in high school, historically it tended to be high achievers, and then it's grown and expanded. But what does it mean? Early college high school means a high school that's designed to get kids on a pathway, on a degree plan, and hopefully to complete some level of college or complete significant college hours and leave, not with just with a diploma, but what I tell the principals in our district, we want our students to graduate with a high school diploma, hopefully a degree or certificate, a degree plan or a plan of life for the next couple of years, kind of what they think their goals are right now, and those may change. But we want them to leave with, 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 with a documented plan of what they intend to do. And, and so what we want to do is have a smooth handoff and transition between, between us and the, and, and, and the next step. Um, so I'm not going to go through every one of these statistics. I think the slides will be available for you all um, uh, afterwards, but I won't go through every one, but just... You know, the, the percent, the nationally, 30% or so of early college high school students complete an associate degree way above in, in uh, regular high schools. Um, it's not uncommon for early college high schools to have 50, 80, or even close to 100% of students getting their associate degree, for example. Um, most early college high school students, virtually all early college high school students get some, um, you know, some, some college work. They have higher graduation rates. I think that's one of your, your goals. They have better college outcomes, um, even better than dual enrollment students. 
They're more likely to enroll in college after high school, keep on going in college. You heard Brian, his goal is to keep on going, to, to keep on going in college. They're going to have a higher GPA. They're going to have better college graduation rates. It makes a lot of sense. What we found is that as our young people, again, very much like Brian, when they get in a, a specific course of study and they select a major and they start studying, they start planning for something that's for their future, for their life, all of a sudden they get it. See, for most high school students in America, they don't see the relationship between high school and the rest of their life. High school is like a rite of passage. You're supposed to go to high school, and you're going to get that piece of paper, and then that's supposed to mean something. Then they get out of life with that piece of paper, and that piece of paper just doesn't work like magic like, like they thought it would, you know, because we've kind of led them to believe that. And it's really because, you know, 50 years ago, 80 years ago, 100 years, that is what you needed. And then you went to work for your... You know, for your, you know, for your neighbor, you went to work on the family farm, or if you go 100, 200 years ago, the, you know, your parents divided five acres off and gave them to you, and you lived there, or you worked on the factory in town down the street, or whatever, and it was pretty clear what you were going to do. If you were in a coal mining family, then you went to work for the coal mine, and, and so forth, so it was pretty clear, but it doesn't work that way today. So the, what we've seen with these young people, there's something real powerful in high school about them selecting a degree plan and something they're going to study. And at the end of the day, even if they decide, and I think, again, I heard that from, from Brian, is like, this is not what I want to do from now on. Now I'm going to take another step. Even at the end of the day, if they decide that's not what they want to do the rest of their life, the fact that they've engaged in that, see value in that, they start committing to that. Then we also try to teach our young people, how do you stack and how do you leverage? So, for example, um, I've got a young lady, I like to use an example, immigrant from Mexico, Live in a very poor, well, what we call colonias, very, very, very poor, poverty-stricken neighborhood that's primarily an immigrant neighborhood. First in her family to go to college. She got her associate degree in engineering in high school uh, in 2008. She got her associate degree in engineering while she was in high school. She went to Stanford, got her bachelor's degree in en engineering in Stanford. Um, so imagine, this is somebody that, she came from Mexico when she was like 12 or 13 years old. Uh, low income, nobody in her family had ever had, you know, educational completion or anything. She wound up in Stanford, then wound up at UT Austin on a master's PhD program in engineering. Uh, I'm sort of mixed feelings. She dropped out at the master's PhD program, at least for now. She'll probably go back. But, you know, she, dro she dropped out to co-found with an Asian American student that she met at Stanford. They co-founded what within one year became a multi-million dollar nonprofit. Okay, so that's, that's, um, that's, that's stacking, and I'm not, every student's not going to do that, but Cecilia wouldn't have done that without the early college high school and the associate degree in engineering. Um, it it, it would have been a very different pathway in life for her. Leveraging is the student who might go and maybe study welding and then go study engineering and take what they've learned in welding and combine that together. Or a student who might study medical, study to be, study nursing or whatever, and then go to law school. Every hospital wants to hire because the most frustrating thing in this business, we live in a society where law is real important and lawyers are real important. You hire a lawyer, you've got this big case, maybe a patient suing you or whatever, and your lawyer doesn't understand a darn thing about medicine. And so they, they keep missing like what's relevant and what's not relevant. You've got to spend a lot of time you know, going over with them. But if you've got a, a, a lawyer that was a nurse, in fact, not only does the hospital want to hire that lawyer, so does the other side that wants to, to sue the hospital want to hire that lawyer. So, both, so that lawyer's got it made because both sides want that lawyer that knows, that knows medicine. So I, I call that leveraging when, they, when they, might, they might study two or three different things, but then they figure out this unique pack, package. I have people that tell me <coughs> well, they're too young at 16. They're going to change their mind. They're going to, well, gosh, how many? I changed my mind. I don't know how many times in college. I changed my mind in life. I never intended to be a superintendent or a principal or, you know, or any of those things. How many of us are doing what we thought we were going to do when we were 25 or when we were 26? And so many of us, uh, you know, change careers. So, but when the young people start thinking about that seriously at a younger age, they, they engage. Better outcomes. Um, what's really interesting is... All this kind of started like dual enrollment for the top students. What they found with both dual enrollment and early college is the outcomes are even better, has a bigger impact on students who were performing below grade level. Students who are performing grade level are much more impacted by the, the early college opportunity than students who were doing just fine. Students 
who don't have the family supports do much better in early college, or have not that they do better, but they, it may, it, it's more life changing for them than a student whose parents have all the educational background and the parents are making sure that Johnny has everything ready and Johnny's going to go to the college that dad went to and all of that kind of stuff. Well, that, that student is probably going to do not a whole lot different whether they have the early college opportunity or not. They might do a little bit better, but the other student does dramatically different. Um, especially powerful for minority students, low-income youth, first-generation college growers. These are what the research all over the nation is saying about early college. And so I like to look at it. The demography does not have to be destiny. We, we need to use different strategies. We need, to, we need to do education different, both high school and college, in all honesty. And so we talk about success by design. And so that's, that's an important word here. And what we're looking at is a sustained systemic transformation. How do we build and how do we design and how do we create and how do we do all of these things to, to, uh, to impact this? Because it's a huge challenge to boldly say we're going to restructure the system so that we can connect every single student. That's, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. Our goal is to be a game changer in our community. We believe that if we can do this at scale, our community over... over Really, not that long of a time, it's going to be, be changing quite a bit. We're, we're determined. And so no matter what the ethnic makeup, socioeconomic makeup is your community, whether you're rural, whether, you know, whether you're a larger system or whatever, we're determined that demographics will not be our destiny. How do we build on the strength? How do you build on the strengths? There are strengths in a rural community. So how do you build on those? So strengths... In a, in a large city. There's strengths in our being on the border so, where commerce is basically most of the time, those of you that are busy going to the stores and most of the conversations at the checkouts and everything, all, mo, the, the language of commerce is mostly Spanish. You can probably survive easier in our area if you don't know English than if you don't know Spanish because you're more likely to r run into workers in different industries that don't know English than, 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 than the other way around. So how do we build on the strengths? Well, in our case, like I said, we work on, on, on developing literacy. The Hispanic community is a very family-oriented community. So that's a strength. Rural communities have those. So how do you build on strengths? Um, our goal is that our students will outperform state and national averages in terms of college completion. That's pretty bold. Because I told you that the state of Texas educational attainment is below the national average. The Rio Grande Valley, the part, of the, the part of the state that we're from, is way below the state average. And our community is a poor working class community, even for our area. So the educational attainment levels of the adult community where, where we are is even below our, our general area. Um, why do we say that? Well, I mentioned earlier. We've already done that on the high school dropout rate. So if you see that blue line that starts way up high and drops low, that's... That's PSJ's longitudinal or cohort dropout rate. So back, back when we kind of got rolling, the district was losing almost 20% of, of, of the students out of, every, out of every cohort advancing through the system. And like I said, it was more than twice. I think the state rate was about 8.8% .8 at that time. In two years, we dropped below the state rate, and now we're running uh, way, well below. And our cohort loss rate now is 3.2%. And we're running roughly, we've kind of leveled off down there. We're trying to get it lower, but now we're getting into the really, really challenging, really tough cases where either people move and you just absolutely can't find them or, or, or situations that we're going to have to get even more creative and have more partners to, to bring in the social supports to, to impact those. <coughs> but it's down. Uh, so the red line, the blue line is our district. The red line is our region the Rio Grande Valley as a whole, and the kind of the lime green area is, is the state rate. And so you can see that, like I said, we've dropped well below our surrounding area and, and the state average. We want our students to graduate from high school on time. So when we started in 2007, the four-year graduation rate was 62%. That's, you know, that's reasonably comparable to what a lot of inner cities are. Some inner cities are in the 50s, some I've even 
occurred in the 40s, but 50, 60 percent is pretty comparable for inner, inner city level. At that time, the state's four-year graduation rate was about 78 percent. So we were running 16 percentage points behind. The last data out in this year's will be very similar. And again, we're kind of getting up at that level where it's the, the on-time graduation rate now, uh, using the federal, the federal measurement is 90.1 percent. So we've gone from 62 percent to 90.1 percent. It's What, what it does show is that it is, it is doable with, you know, with, that, with that focus and commitment. Our, our long term, when you add in five years, six years, and so forth, we ultimately get pretty close to 96 to 97% of our students ultimately do graduate from high school. And if they're taking extra time after the four years, we, we invite them to, to the campus for older, for 18 to 26-year-olds, and we keep and, and we engage them in college work if they haven't already. We try to engage them in college work or get them uh, to continue on that. Um, so over, over time, like I mentioned, we got an opportunity to open a, 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 a standalone. It was a STEM early college high school, and we committed to using that as a laboratory to scale early college high school across the district. And over the years, then, we've begun to do that. And so we started after that. Uh, two years later, we started with a school, within a school concept, at one of our large comprehensive high schools. Our large comprehensive high schools have 2,000 to 2,200 students, roughly. And so we opened a school within a school, again, where the students would apply, those who were interested, and using a lottery method, select them, and so forth. Um, then we, we built, uh, our high schools were overcrowded at the time, and the district was had gone through some rapid growth. We opened a fourth high school, and that one, we went wall to wall with early college high school. So it's right now, that's about a 17, 1800 student high school with, with wall to wall. It, the, the complete high school is early college high school. That's challenging. That's challenging to do that. It's challenging on us. It's challenging on the, on the partner. You, you know, what, what we look at is you begin the work, you begin setting benchmarks, and each cohort, the goal is to do better than the, than the cohort before. But you, the, the idea is to set the goal from day one. At this high school, we're going to build out the capacity to connect every student. And, uh, and, and that we want every student to, to be able to complete. Um, so we work, we've been working in four different kind of settings. And, and so those show on the blocks here. So on the bottom left-hand quadrant, we, we've had an initiative we call Back on Track to College. And so our dropout recovery high school, that's what we call it, a back on track. Not just a back on track high school, but a back on track to college high school. And then uh, we have another alternative high school for younger students, ages 15 up to, they can be up to 21. Um, and we, we started connecting dual enrollment into that, into that, high, into that high school. And then we had a high school uh, when I got to the district, they had a program at a separate site. I went ahead and made it an official high school to give it more, uh, uh, I guess, um, traction. And it's a, it's, a, it's a high school for teenage moms. And we began working d dual enrollment in that high school. Now, as of last year, the high school for teenage moms was officially qualified by the state agency as an official early college high school. So we have what may be the first early college high school for teenage moms. And I think that's a great... <laughs> and it's, a, it's amazing because already just in, in one year of the, of, of the transition, even though the transition is primarily for the incoming freshmen, the high school gets a label on it, and we're already seeing the young ladies, um, you know, see, seeing themselves different. Now in our district, just as a disclaimer, teenage moms don't have to go to that high school. They can stay at their home high school, and, and some do. And then we have different scenarios. Some come there what, when they're expecting, and then after they deliver, they go back to their home high school. Some come there and like the supports because it's kind of like an early college high school is designed to merge the two. Well, this, this high school is designed completely around supporting t teenage moms. So some like the extra supports and attention they get there and that they're not the one 
they're not the one young lady in the classroom that has to explain to the teacher why she was absent extra times or this or that or the other because the baby was sick or whatever happened, but that the, the teachers and counselors at high school know and they're prepared for that scenario and they're planning for that scenario. So the young ladies make the choice of, of, which, of which setting that they prefer. But now the nice thing is if they're leaving an early college high school, they're transferring into an early college high school, they decide to transfer back, they're transferring back to an early college high school. Then we've done um, school within a school. And so our, our other three high schools all opened up school within a school where about one fourth of the entering freshmen entered into early college high school. And then we've been scaling that. We went from 25% to 50%, and then this next year's freshman cohort will be 100% of the entering freshmen. We're just going to go ahead and go wall to wall. And I'll be honest with you, we rushed that a little bit because there's changes. When you know that there's agency changes coming and changes coming at state leadership, sometimes it's better to... Uh, there's a beachhead there, and you see an opportunity to grab a little more territory, grab it. <laughs> And, and kind of anchor yourself in there so that you're already, so that you're already there. And so, that's, that's, and so we've, we've, we've gone a little faster on that part than I initially uh, in, intended to about a year and a half ago, just, just saying I hate to get to the point where we're like it's in sight and then something and then have something occur. Um, and it probably would not, but after having fought many battles over the years, and I won't even get into all of that, as we're trying to scale of having people say no and you can't do that, and that's not early college. Early college high school is this one sterile model where you have 100 students per cohort and you've got to do it this way and that and, and so forth. And so, so when you start seeing that, 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 that you can you know, make movement, you've got to take advantage of the opportunity. And then, uh, so basically now, this coming year, our College Career and Technology Academy, which is for the 18 to 26 year olds, and our other alternative high school have both been approved by the state agency as early college high schools. So now we're back on track. Uh, 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 schools are also early college high schools. I mentioned dual to degree because even the students that were not in early college high school, we were trying to get them into dual enrollment wherever we could and work on dual to degree plans. But early college high school, is really the scenario that we want to work in because now in our district it's also a label that 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 um, that carries a lot you know a, a lot with it so we've worked with different models we worked through different ways I won't go in detail on those you can look at those later our goals as we go over over time one of our goals is that by 2018 we want over 90 percent of our we'll be we're graduating now about 2,000 students a year which is great. When I got to the district, it was less than 1,000. We're graduating uh, close to 2,000 students a year. And our goal is by 2018, over 90% of those will, have, will be graduating with 12 or more college hours. Another goal that we have is we, we have a kind of a timeline and goals. By, by 2018, we want 1,000 or 50%. And 50% doesn't sound big. If I was in Hidalgo, 50% wouldn't be a lot. If, you, if I was in a single early college high school, 50% wouldn't be a lot. But for a large system with 8,000 something students, that's a lot for us in the college to figure out how to do. But our goal is that by 2018, 1,000 of our high school graduates will have crossed the college stage when Brian did, before he graduated from high school. This year, we got very close to 500. We fell a little short on the associate degrees. My principals tell me we're on track to get back uh, up on our timeline, but this year we had almost 500 of our high school students cross the college stage before graduation day. We had about 230 associate degrees, associate degrees in engineering, in chemistry, in physics, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in interdisciplinary studies, in, in, in history, in psychology, in different fields. In some of those fields, mathematics, the majority of the college's associate degrees were to our high school students in, so, in some of those fields. And so that's, that, you know, that, 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 says, that's, that says a lot. Um, we're certifications in welding and different, in, 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 uh, uh, in different computer fields and things like that. And so we're working forward on that. Um, and so this slide just kind of, uh, it, you, know, it, it, you know, goes into some more detail of that. The, the parents love that we save these young people 
and save the parents and the young people two years of college tuition, and that can be worth millions when you're working at scale. Um, as we move forward, I lost my train of thought there. I'm going to go very quickly now on some, just some policy issues. And again, these will be on your slides. Um, what, are the, what are the policy issues? When you're working with your state, some of these we have, and some of these we, we just got. But for dual enrollment classes or any kind of early college, the state of Texas pays the college their state funds as if it was any other college student. They pay the district, our state funds, and then we negotiate how to do the rest. Our community college, quote, waives tuition. We figure out who pays for the teacher, who provides the teacher. We provide it or they provide it, and we pay them an instructor fee. Textbooks, we buy the books. The college tries. If we have classes that are predominantly our high school students, they try to commit to holding the textbooks for about three years. We actually buy the books and issue them like regular high school textbooks and then we collect them to try to make this uh, uh, affordable and everything else. Um, we, we do it in career, in career and technology courses at South Texas College. In our case, they waive tuition for high school students. And they're working, districts all around us are now really going gung-ho on this. So, so this is a big deal for th this college. They have 13,000 dual enrollment students a semester now. We, uh, 3,000 are, are, are ours and the other 9 or 10,000 are other, other districts around now. Um, they provide faculty as we need. Um, they train, they've trained now, we've gone to a different level than, than pretty much the other districts at this point. All of our high school counselors have been trained as college advisors by the college, so they can be working jointly with our students on degree planning and, and, and all of that. Um, we have something called trans, college transition specialists that we started a number of years ago. We have high school counselors that we pay for. The college gives them offices, they're housed at the college, and their job is primarily to work with the students that graduate. When we hand them that diploma, we actually have an employee of ours waiting for them at the college door to get their high school transcript and that diploma, get them in the seat and monitor them and, and be there to help them during that first year and try to get them back in the seat the second year. So we're seeing real good college persistence rates with that. So we're really focused on college completion. We're saying that we, we're taking responsibility. I like to tell the parents at graduation and different ceremonies, I tell parents, parents, I've got good news and bad news for you. Good news is you did it, your kids got the diploma, everything. The bad news is guess what? You're not done. They're going on to college or whatever, they're gonna start writing home, mom, dad, I need money, I need the credit card. I, I crashed the car, this happened, that happened, what am I gonna do or whatever, or they, even if they're living at home, I need help with this, I'm stuck. So we tell the parents is guess what? The bad news is you're not done. Let me tell you the good news, PSJ is not done either. So we continue providing supports for the students. So we have network support for students that are away and for the surrounding colleges, we have counselors that we pay for that are housed because we are determined our students will complete and we will, we will, we will commit to that. I can't go into a lot of detail on that, but it's changed the way the college works because when we're in there working with them, we see things, we realize our counselors thought they knew what they were doing to get the re kids ready for college, but they didn't understand from the college side. We also see there that the college thinks they know what to do to get these kids in, but they're missing a lot of things. And so we have that bridge person that's very, very important. Um, they provide, um, so I, I mentioned that a little bit. We pay an extra stipend to the, to the teachers. We pay an instructor fee to the college. We bus students to the college as needed. On the state slide, I think I missed a point there. Just this year, finally, the state agreed. The state has always had in their uh, transportation funding formula that they would fund for students to be bused to career and technology sites. And I've been pushing for two or three years. How about college sites? How about where college courses? How about for academic? And so just this year, the commissioner issued a letter saying that we could get not only funding for this year, but back funding for last year if we had kept the documentation. So now we get state transportation funding for busing students to college sites. So those are things you can work on if you don't already have. I talked about textbooks, college readiness testing. <coughs> Our state has a college readiness exam. A lot of states do. I don't know if yours does. We, all of our high schools are now official college readiness testing sites, so we can test students as needed, and we, we offer that uh, to, our, to our students. Um, we offer a lot of college transition support. The college and us together, 
We have planning committees for all the different issues. We were having a lot of challenges, and sometimes we were knocking heads. So we created planning committees to plan and design and all of these things. We have MOUs in place to establish responsibilities, and we've redone those. We have a data sharing agreement now. Our counselors can now go online and get into our kids' degree plans, get into their GPAs, they, because they're college advisors. So we've gotten past all the FERPA issues and all that kind of stuff. The college actually now can grab and grab out all of our student data, of our students and our graduates. They dump it in our computers and our data system, and then we get in there and we do all we want with it to figure out what our success rate. We can do all the data analysis we want to find out what's happening with our students. Um, we take joint responsibility for a lot of these areas. We share facilities and equipment. And in closing, I'm going to mention some things that I've kind of learned as we go along. When we talk about doing, doing this different, we, we need to, what we've looked at as you scale is we need to work, we work in more and more in academies and cohorts. Academies and cohorts for students. So we have all these, we now have eight early, one, two, three, four, eight early college high schools now going into next year. Four large comprehensive, one standalone STEM, two alternative for off-track students, and one for teenage moms. What we're doing now is still out of those, what if only three students over there want to study something, two there, five, so we're creating district central located academies that are really like college setups where we bus the students together and so we get put together a medical pathway. I mentioned last night to the small group that we were there, really excited in January. We're partnering with private industry more and more. In January, partnering with a local hospital, we had a cohort of sophomore students enter, as sophomores, enter a nursing degree program whereby by their high school graduation day they will have their associate degree in nursing and be ready to sit their RM boards. So each of these academies, we're, we're, we're bringing in private industry, bringing in technology companies, bringing in the banking industry, bringing in the grocery industry. What do you need? What kind of work, you know, what kind of degrees and skills and things? Then we're asking them, not necessarily for money, but help us degree plan. Help us figure it out. Bring in the college and help us and the college together to figure out where we need to tweak our program. So that's working um, really well. And uh, as we, like I said, as we go forward, then uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a cybersecurity academy. We've got a partnership with the local police department and the college to create a police academy. The, the high school students are too young for the police academy, but they can get their associate degree in criminal justice in that same setting, working side by side with the officers that are in the police academy, and working with our workforce board and so forth. So partnerships are important. Our message to our students is start college now. Start college while you're in high school. Complete early. Complete in high school if at all possible, but if not, be ready to complete right after high school. Complete early and go far. What does go far mean? It means don't stop there. Stack, leverage but add value to your opportunities so that you can have a great career and life opportunity and plan. So that's, there's some of our partners. Uh, thank you very much, and like I said, uh, make it work in your community.